welcome everyone um, to the Troy Public Library's virtual program. Um, it's the first lecture in the Talk Artie to Me series with Gene Wisniewski, um, our wonderful presenter and art extraordinaire <laughs> who we have with us tonight. Um, so like I mentioned, we're going to talk about the tutors tonight. Um, and just as a just as a brief thank you to the friends of the Troy Public Library who allow us to put on these wonderful programs. Um, if you're willing to support them, their bookstore is open on the weekends, Saturdays from 10 to 1 p.m. and Sundays 1 to 4 p.m. So definitely go check out their book sale because again, those proceeds are what allow us to bring in wonderful presenters like Jean. Um, a bit of housekeeping, if you have questions, use the chat over the Q&A. I'll be monitoring the chat throughout and then I can let Gene know that there is a question in the chat and he can respond to it. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Gene now. Okay, thanks so much. Those are really nice compliments to receive. I hope I live up to uh, the introduction. Um, essentially, I'm going to start this lecture the way pretty much any tutor lecture should start with a statement that every of what he says about the tutors is that they only ruled for 120 years, of fewer than 120 years actually, and three generations, and yet they're one of the most famous dynasties ever. Everybody knows who they are, and they are a source of endless fascination. And oh, there's my little arrow to advance. I need my cursor over there. Okay. So this, by the way, this is who I am. We'll be seeing this later. That was my introductory slide I was supposed to show you. In any case, let's get right to the subject at hand. Judging by the number of movies that just have been made about the, the tutors, uh, including Anne Boleyn's sister, the other Boleyn girl, her essential claim to fame was that she had an affair or was the mistress of Henry VIII before he married her sister and beheaded her. Uh, and probably, although we're not for sure, it's not known for sure, bore two of Henry VIII's children and she has her own movie. So there are thousands of movies about the Tudors in all forms and in drama, comedy, carry on Henry VIII, I mean, clearly a comedy there. So, uh, and so this, yeah. So the Tudors are just incredibly famous, partially for a number of reasons. There was a recent Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, exhibition on the Tudors that just closed. And their viewpoint on it was that they crafted themselves an image. And that's certainly legitimate. We're going to talk about that a lot, mostly in terms of their portraits. Uh, and we're going to talk about their history and why they had to craft that image. But there's also just the fact of it's sort of like people have this fascination with the TV show Dynasty. And this is a real dynasty with a country and everything. Uh, and the soap opera that takes place is just an incredible story. and. It has a huge cast of characters, even though they only ruled for fewer than 120 years. Henry VIII married six times, and all three of his children got to reign. So there's an enormous cast of characters, considering how short a reign they did have. Uh, the Tudor claim to the throne was very tenuous. Uh, Henry VII, who is the first Tudor monarch, was the uh, pre-marriage child of the fourth son of the reigning king, Edward IV, so not exactly on deck for the throne. He was really far removed from the main family and considered illegitimate besides. So that was one of the reasons why the Tudor had, the Judas had to expend so much energy into establishing themselves and building their reputation as a power in Europe. Um, let's see. They compensated by hiring a lot of artisans and artists from all over Europe. They were very well acquainted with everything that was going on on the continent to build their image and to show their wealth and prestige. So they came to a power essentially as a result of the War of the Roses, which as you see lasted for about 30 years or so. And this was a war between two houses of the same dynasty. It was called the Plantagenet dynasty, and this is the one that came right before the Tudors. And this one branch was called the uh, Lancaster branch, and the other side was the York branch, and they had a fight with each other to see who would claim the throne. The Plantagenet dynasty had been in power for about 300 years, and the Lancaster uh, branch had ruled for about 50 years, and the War of the Roses might never have happened except for the fact of, that Henry VI, who was of the Lancaster branch, was unable to rule, essentially. He was very meek. 
he was adverse to war and all kinds of things. You know, any anything to do with ruling didn't really appeal to him. Plus, he was sort of mentally unstable. He went into a catatonic state essentially for 18 months at one point. Uh, it's not known exactly what his malady was, but they I think the the term they came up with was catatonic schizophrenia is their possible diagnosis. It could have been some kind of depression. But in any case, he was a very ineffectual ruler, and he inherited the Hundred Years' War, uh, which was a war between England and France over who owned France, France or England. We'll get into that a little too. Uh, in any case, the real power behind the throne was his wife, Margaret of Anjou. So the War of the Roses, which lasted 30 years and was between the Lancaster and the York branches, was essentially to overthrow Henry VI and his wife, Margaret of Anjou. Uh, let's see, catch up to my notes here. Also, England was kind of in a state of near anarchy under his rule because he was so very ineffectual. Now, the Hundred Years' War between France and England was a war that lasted five generations and it ended only two years before the War of the Roses. So England went from a hundred year long war, hundred plus year long war, uh, had a two year break and then immediately launched into a 30 year civil war. Uh, and so what the hundred years war was, was between the Plantagenet dynasty and the Valois dynasty in France over who owned the northern part of France, including the city of Rennes, where all the French kings were crowned, and the city of Paris itself. Uh, so Henry VI was actually the last British monarch who was both king of England and the north of France. But under Henry VI, they lost all of their belongings in France, England lost all their belongings in France, except for one little port city called Calais up in the very north of France. Uh, and the reason that they wanted to rule the French uh, throne as well as the English throne was that France was the preeminent power in Europe at the time. The Hundred Years' War, by the way, is also very famous for including Joan of Arc, who was burned at the stake after she was captured by the English. Uh, in any case, England had this imaginary claim to the throne really all the way up until after the French Revolution happened. So, I mean, for all the way up to like 1789, England still had this fantasy that it owned the north of France. And you're going to see the French fleur de lis, uh, the symbol of France here, that uh, iris flower, that stylized iris flower that represents France. Uh, you're going to see that in a lot of pictures of English monarchs as well. Uh, am I going at a good pace? Everybody following so far? Okay. So uh, let's see here. Da, da, da. Yes, I think I made this script. Like there's like three facts on every single one of these pages. So if I talk for more than three minutes, I just cut through like 19 pages to get to my next notes to find out where I am. In any case, as a result of the War of the Roses, neither the House of Lancaster nor the House of York won. The Tudors won, and that's Henry VII. Uh, who we were talking about before, this illegitimate, way, way removed cousin. Uh, he had his supporters and he came to England and eventually took the throne. And what he did symbolically to uh, make peace was to combine the white rose of the York House and the red rose of the Lancaster House into what was called the Tudor Rose, which was red and white. And you're going to see that symbol used in a lot of their paintings as well. Uh, he also uh, married the widow of the uh, king that was overthrown. Uh, so, by the way, these, these symbols, uh, these roses, were kind of not really as symbolic as people think. For instance, the Lancaster rose was only adopted about 30 years before, or a few years, a couple of years, two years before the War of the Roses ended. And the York House had plenty of other symbols besides the right rose to symbolize their house. So it's kind of a poetic conceit that these roses really represented these houses. Uh, uh, but it, it was sort of handy to kind of tie it together to say, oh, yes, they're represented by these two roses. And it's called the War of the Roses. So what we are looking at here is Edward IV. And he was the last uh, king uh, who uh, died at age 40 and in the year 1483. He ruled uh, from 1461 to 1470. Then Henry VI was reinstated for a while, the mentally unstable Henry VI. And then uh, after Henry VI was killed, 
in prison. He died in prison. It's thought that uh, Edward uh, murdered him uh, to, to gain the throne. Uh, then uh, Henry uh, Edward was reinstated to the throne. And eventually, uh, Edward's younger brother, Richard III, uh, inherited the throne after uh, Edward died. Uh, because he, Richard III, who was not really in line for the third, he was Edward's younger brother. He murdered Edward's children to gain the throne. Uh, so he murdered his own nephews and he took the throne and he was written about in a Shakespeare play and has been portrayed as one of the most evil rulers ever throughout history. And we're going to talk about how his image was kind of crafted by the Tudors as well. So is everybody following this? This is very complicated so far. And there's so many Edwards, you have no idea. I mean, there's Edwards popping up everywhere. So Edward IV was uh, eventually lost his, he died and his uh, brother killed his two nephews to gain the throne and that's Richard III. And this, oh, we're gonna talk about the portraits of Richard III. Uh, both of these, as you see, were painted posthumously. So we don't really know what these rulers look like, but Richard III is portrayed in the Shakespeare play as a hunchback with a limp and a withered arm. They uh, clearly uh, revamped his image. You'll notice that one of his shoulders here is a lot higher than the other, indicating that he was a hunchback. Uh, and that hunchback was actually added later uh, by the Tudor family. His shoulders were actually a lot more even early on. And they did dig up his corpse and they found that um, he did not have a withered arm, he did not have a limp, and he did not have a humpback. He only had my, some degree of scoliosis, some curvature in his spine, which was then exaggerated by the tutors to make him look less legitimate. Also, um, yeah, he's also made to look kind of steely-eyed, and his uh, the color was added to his eyes, the kind of bluish-gray color that's in his eyes to make him look more sort of intense. And then there were corners added to his mouth later on to look more sort of look more sort of nasty. So they turned down the corner of his mouth later. This painting was heavily retouched. Uh, anyway, the two nephews that were killed by Richard III uh, were known as the princes in the tower. And there's been a lot of plays and movies about them as well. So in any case, Richard III ruled just over two years until he was taken, uh, killed by Henry the seventh in a battle. Uh, one of the things they found when they dug up Richard III's skeleton was not only his scoliosis, his lack of a withered arm and lack of a limb, they did find a kind of coin slot in the type of his skull, which was the blow that killed him when Henry VII killed him in battle. So this is the establishment of finally the Tudor dynasty. Everybody got that out of the way so far? Do we have any questions? No? Okay, have we lost anybody yet? <laughs> That's another good question. Okay, sip of water, please. Gene, we've actually gained people. <laughs> we've gained people. Yeah, oh, that's a good people. sign. Yeah. All right. So stay with us, folks. It's going to be fascinating. So here we have Henry the Seventh. After all that falderall with the War of the Roses and all the previous evil doing of the Plantagenet dynasty, the end of the Plantagenet dynasty, we have the first Tudor ruler of England, Henry the Seventh. And we went over how, um, you know, illegitimate his rule was considered at the time. Uh, but let's see. Okay. Henry was an exiled nobleman, and he tried to gain the throne once before, uh, as had his father, uh, who uh, he was a distant relative of the Lancasters. And as I said before, his claim to the throne was uh, very tenuous. He was also the last English king to have to claim his throne through battle. Back in these days, you have to also remember, this is kind of before the days of absolute rule, like you saw in Spain and France under Louis XIV and, say, Philip IV. English monarchs had a constitutional monarchy, and they kind of had to be approved of by the people, I mean, ostensibly at least, and the clergy and the nobles, you know, they ruled with the grace of their countrymen. And Henry VII was actually the last king to have to fight for his throne through battle. So after Richard III was killed, Henry was crowned, and he married Elizabeth of York, who was the sister of Edward V, who was uh, the king who was the potential king who was killed in the tower. 
Everybody got that? <laughs> I know that's a, that's a toughie. Uh, Edward V was one of the princes in the towers who was killed by Richard III in order for Richard III to gain the throne. And he had a sister and Henry VII married that sister, thereby unifying the houses of Lancaster that Henry belonged to and the house of York that Elizabeth married uh, belonged to. Got that? Okay. It's very, very complicated, but from here on in, I swear it gets easier because we have one king after another and they all follow very logically. Uh, so you see there's a lot of symbolism in this painting. This was probably done as a wedding portrait. Uh, monarchs very often, you have to think about this, you know, they were very often married for political reasons and they never met each other until they were betrothed. Sometimes they were betrothed by the age of like nine or something, assuming that they were going to get married when they were of age and unite these kingdoms. There were these political marriages and this was sent uh, as a wedding portrait to the Habsburg family, which was much, much more established and had already been in power for about 400 years. Uh, so uh, he is pictured, you know, in this uh, portrait wearing a very, very rich cloak, which is called cloth of gold. And it's made, I actually saw some of this in the Tudor exhibition at the Met. They took silk thread or something and wrapped gold around it. So this was a very, very expensive material. And he's showing kind of in an understated way his extreme wealth. You see he's also holding the Tudor rose in his hand. And um, that's symbolic of the legitimacy of his kingdom. Around his neck, he's also wearing the uh, Order of the Golden Fleece. This was a chivalric order, an order of knighthood. And the Habsburgs belonged to it. And he also belonged to it. And he's showing off this, you know, this necklace, and he's wearing it instead of the English chivalric order. There was an English knighthood called the Order of the Garter, and he could have worn that, but instead he chose to wear the, the Order of the Golden Fleece to make himself look more established. So there's an awful lot of symbolism in this painting, plus the way he just has himself, um, you know, uh, portrayed very kind of mellow, maybe not the best looking guy, but very nice. And supposedly he was a good ruler. He did do a lot of good things for England. Uh, this painting may have been done by more than one artist because the necklace and parts of the hair show more skill than some of the other parts, uh, than say like the eyes and the face, you know, if you really look at it closely. He also has a very direct gaze. Uh, and this, uh, he's holding, yeah, we talked about that. Oh, and his cloth, his cloth of gold cloak is also lined with ermine. Ermine uh, is symbolic of royalty because as legend had it, uh, an ermine would rather die than soil its beautiful white fur. And so somehow this idea of purity became associated with royalty. I don't know, <laughs> but it's some kind of symbolic sign of purity uh, that became associated with royalty because of this legend. Uh, let's see. Uh, there is also an inscription on the ledge of the portrait that it was painted in October on October 20, uh, it was painted October 29th of 1505. And it was ordered by Hermann Rink, who is the ambassador of the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I. And so consequently, this is a marriage portrait for Maximilian's daughter, Margaret of Savoy. He was hoping to unite England with the House of Habsburg, which was a much more established dynasty. Uh, Margaret did not marry him in the end, but she did keep the portrait. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the things that Henry did for England. He did manage to start to bring England into the Renaissance. The Renaissance Can I stop already... you just for a second? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, we got a question about the Golden Fleece. Um, yeah. And so Nancy is asking if the Golden Fleece, is it the same like symbol that Brooks Brothers has incorporated into their branding? <laughs> I have no idea. I didn't know Brooks Brothers had done that. Yeah. You know? I would, I, that's a good question. I have no idea. I'm sorry I can't answer it. but. Yeah. I mean, is the Order of the Golden Fleece, Fleece is around for a very, very long time. It's a very ancient order. So it was really very prestigious, you know. So, but I, as far as Brooks, I have no idea, but that's a very good question. It's interesting, but it shows how this stuff eventually leaches into pop culture, you know. 
There's a whole section in the uh, John Berger book, Ways of Seeing, where he talks about how a lot of advertising steals things from classical uh, paintings. You know, the, a lot of the tropes that are in classical paintings are also used in advertising. Maybe not so much these days, but more in the past. But yeah, you do see a lot of stuff that are stuff that's kind of symbols from painting showing up in modern day advertising. Yeah, that's a very good question, but I can't answer it for you. I'm sorry. Probably does. I yeah. found something from their website that I think they were trying to reference, and I'll link it so everyone can have it. Um, but it, yeah, I think they kind of were, which is really funny. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Brooks Brothers. I guess they want to keep up their. I don't know if Brooks Brothers quite quite that reputation, but you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So. Uh, in any case, Henry VII also brought a lot of power, you know, stability to England, and he established it as a major power. He instituted a lot of uh, economic and administrative and diplomatic initiatives. Uh, he was also very thrifty, and he did build the economy up. Remember, England was a state in a state of anarchy at the end of the Plantagenet dynasty, uh, uh, and he did uh, build up the English economy very much uh, by supporting the English wool trade, which is another thing that comes up later in the 1600s of Charles II. He was also a big supporter of the English wool trade. And this is part of the reason why English wools are so famous, I think. Uh, so he did bring England uh, into the modern era. Uh, and this picture was completed two years after his wife, Elizabeth of York died. That's why he was trying to get married again to Maximilian I's daughter. Uh, but he actually was not in very good health and died a couple of years after this painting was done, uh, probably from tuberculosis, although it's not known for sure, at the age of 52. He was kind of tall guy, very slim, uh, blue eyes, noticeably bad teeth, apparently, but that was kind of common back then. So I don't know why they make a big deal out of it. Uh, but he was also very amiable, friendly and a very good ruler. Um, so, yeah, I think we've got pretty much everything we want to talk about there. Excuse me, I rifle through a couple of more pages. Yeah, so, okay, so that's everything. Now we're going to get to the next Tudor ruler who's really, really, really famous, Henry VIII. Uh, Henry VIII, uh, yes, ruled from 1491 to 1547, a 36-year reign. Or he, sorry, he was born in 1491 and died in 1547 at a 36-year reign. Young Henry was very handsome, very athletic, very clever, loved to give big lavish parties. He was the very opposite of his very serious father. He was over six feet tall. He loved jousting, hunting, composing music, and throwing lavish parties, as I said before. He did make certain contributions to England, but he also was not really necessarily overall the greatest ruler. He did introduce the Bible in English, uh, translated from Latin. He did value educated women and liked to surround himself with intelligent women when he wasn't busy kind of disposing of them, of them for his own needs or his own selfish purposes. Uh, but he did like to, uh, he did prize intelligence in women. This was also happening, you have to realize, during the age of discovery. Um, this is when, you know, the first explorations were going out into the new world. This is the era of Galileo and Isaac Newton and Rene Descartes. Uh, and England, he, Henry did try to get England involved in this whole educational movement and tried to get the people of England educated as well. And he did promote education throughout England, which is a major accomplishment. And he once again continued to bring England into the Renaissance and catch up with the continent. The continent. His main rival uh, was Francis I of France, uh, who had brought Leonardo da Vinci to his court. So Henry had, you know, a toll order to fill in order to, you know, become a very prominent power and to help establish England as a prominent power even more than his father had. He also promoted a medical advancement. He established what would eventually become the Royal College of Physicians, also established the Royal Navy and set up England as a major naval power and built a lot of forts in England to help protect the kingdom. His liabilities were that he was a spendthrift built palace after palace after palace. He was ruthless, ruled with an iron fist. It's said that he may have executed as many as 70,000 people, although that number is thought to be kind of highly exaggerated. Uh, but he also did execute a number of his advisors and closest friends, including his chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, after his fourth marriage tanked. 
uh, Thomas Cromwell was supposed to uh, secure Henry uh, a, a divorce and it was unable to. We'll get into that later. He was also very bellicose. He started a lot of wars and got very little gain out of it. For instance, his invasions of Scotland and France, uh, of Scotland, led to a Scottish alliance with France. In other words, by his invading Scotland, Scotland wound up aligning with France, who was England's enemy and the, his rival as well. So Henry married his brother's widow, a Spanish princess named Catherine Aragon. Uh, Henry was not supposed to inherit the throne. His brother Arthur was, but Arthur died at a young age. Uh, and shortly before his coronation, Henry VIII married his brother's widow, to whom he had been betrothed at a very young age. We'll get into more of that later. We get into the history of Henry VIII's six wives. So uh, the painting in 1520 is by an unknown artist, uh, but there is once again a symbolism in his placing a ring on his finger. Back then, that would have been recognized as a symbol of piety, showing Henry standing as a good Catholic. Uh, which didn't work out very well in the end. We'll get into that more too. But officially, Henry was a very devout Catholic and had a very strong alliance with the Pope because Henry denounced Martin Luther when Martin Luther in Germany broke away from the Roman Catholic Church and started the Protestant Reformation. Henry denounced Luther and sided with the Pope and was therefore a Catholic in very good standing. You'll also notice that he does have some fleur-de-lis on his sleeves in the painting, which and the Tudor Roses, which represents the alliance of England and France. And he is wearing around his neck what's called a livery collar or a chain of office to show his rank. But you also see he's not wearing a crown. And that's very common in a lot of these paintings. We'll get into that more too. The painting on the right is by an artist named Jus von Cleve, is from circa 1530 to 1535. And this was painted after Henry had his famous rift with the Pope, which we'll get into. As I think most people know that Henry VIII broke away from the Roman Catholic Church eventually for his own reasons, but we'll cover that shortly. Uh, and that was over his divorce to Catherine of Aragon, his first wife and his brother's widow. Uh, he was already interested by the time the second portrait was done in uh, one of his wife's uh, ladies-in-waiting, a woman named Anne Boleyn. And once again, that'll be covered in the history of the whole wife, the whole wife thing, history. Uh, but he is holding a scroll in his hand, uh, which has a passage from the Bible written on it. It is from Mark uh, chapter 15, verse 16. And the what is written on that little scroll, see this guy, little scroll here? What is written on there is, go ye into the, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, this verse was normally used to establish the Pope, the Roman Catholic Pope, as the heir to St. Peter, the very first Pope. Uh, and this shows that Henry is very arrogantly stating his place as the leader of the new Church of England he would establish. Okay. He also has a very direct gaze and, you know, his hands on his hips that way sort of belie a certain aggressiveness. Uh, and he, his gaze gets even more direct as we look into more portraits of him later on. Now, this is a very famous painting by uh, Hans Holbein, who is Henry VIII's court painter, and it became Henry's kind of iconic pose and the pose that everybody knows Henry VIII as having. And I found this online. I think it's kind of hysterical that all of Henry's six wives are rated with emojis to show how Henry felt about them. And we're going to get into that whole history uh, but this portrait was derived from a portrait that it was originally done in a Whitehall Palace. Uh, Whitehall Palace was destroyed by a fire in 1698, as was this painting of Henry VIII. And this image is based on that original image. And it once again became iconic. This was actually the portrait that Charles Lawton used to base his character of Henry VIII on when he did the movie about Henry VIII, when Charles Lawton played Henry VIII. You see that he's once again not wearing any accoutrements of royalty, no crown, nothing like that. But his pose is very, very arrogant. Uh, he's standing very square, and that cloak he's got on makes him look completely almost rectangular. Uh, he's also got his legs spread apart, which is very arrogant, staring straight into your eyes. His hands are very close to his dagger. Uh, and uh, he's got a big old codpiece, which was a fashion of the time. Uh, 
Actually, in the Tudor show at the Met, they also had a set of Henry VIII's armor. And it's really funny because it's really close to the portrait. And you can see that in the portrait, the leg, Henry's legs are much longer than they were according to his actual armor, which was right across the room. So that's once again, you know, a vanity thing. And this is this is just a little side note. I found a website that had photographs of uh, royalty from the 19th century when they first invented photography next to their official royal portraits that were painted. Big difference. <laughs> so we have really no idea what any of these people really look like because clearly they were all made, meant to flatter. Uh, in any case, this also gives a totally false impression of Henry because by this time, uh, he was already having major health problems. He had ulcerated ulcerations in his legs that prevented him from walking easily. He had a 54-inch waist and uh, had difficulty breathing. He actually, by this point, weighed too much to lead his army on horseback. And when he went into battle, he had to be carried on a litter along the battle lines. Uh, so let's get into the story of Henry VIII's six wives without the emojis, you know, restoring the dignity to these women so I can tell their individual stories. Uh, this is Henry VIII's first wife, Catherine of Aragon. As I said, she was married to uh, uh, Henry's brother, Arthur. Uh, she officially said that the marriage with Arthur was never consummated because he died uh, shortly after they were married. And she, she insisted that the marriage was never consummated. Uh, Henry uses his excuse for wanting a divorce for her uh, that uh, the marriage was cursed because he had committed some form of incest by marrying his brother's widow. And that's why she insisted so strongly that the marriage was never consummated. The reason Henry wanted a divorce from his wife, Catherine of Aragon, was that she did not produce a male heir. What she did was to produce a female heir who was not an heir officially because England had never had a queen before named Mary. And Mary was brought up Catholic and she eventually became Mary I and she did become queen through a series of long circumstances that we'll get into. Uh, Henry's brother Arthur was betrothed to Catherine at age four. They were married, were both were 15 years old and Arthur died five months later. Catherine did, however, act as the ambassador for one year after the ambassador to the Kingdom of Aragon in Spain. Uh, and she was the first woman ambassador in all of the history of Europe. Uh, she was also very strong willed and very capable. In 1513, she served as the Regent of England for six months while Henry VIII was off fighting in France. So she actually ruled England for a short time, during which she repelled a Scottish invasion. Uh, by delivering a speech to the English troops all about their bravery and their patriotism. Uh, Henry sought an annulment after 15 years of marriage because there was no male heir, and he had already gained an interest in this woman, Anne Boleyn, his second wife. As I said, her sister had already had an affair or was the mistress of Henry VIII uh, before her sister married him, and eventually uh, Anne Boleyn was beheaded. Uh, it's also thought that... Uh, Anne Boleyn's sister had uh, was mistress to Francis I of France. She, uh, the sister, also wielded a great deal of power in the English court. So, uh, the reason, part of the reason why the Pope would not grant the annulment uh, or the divorce from ha Catherine of Aragon to Henry was that. Uh, Catherine of Aragon's nephew, see, this is where it gets so complicated in time. You have to understand all these people are cousins, you know, and they all have the same name. So Catherine's nephew was the Holy Roman Emperor uh, and also the King of Spain. And he had over, he had invaded Rome and sacked Rome. And the Pope was basically under the thumb of Catherine of Aragon's nephew. So the Pope played a cat and mouse game with Henry and with the Holy Roman Emperor. And Henry got so fed up with his game playing that he finally just broke away from the church. So that is the whole reason uh, why Henry VIII wanted to establish his own church and to uh, divorce his wife. After the divorce, she, di she died about three years later, and she did have this daughter, Mary, who was a Catholic. So now let's talk a little more about Anne. Any questions? So far, so good? Anybody hopelessly confused? Did anything straightened out? I will say there's one question from like um, 
about 10 minutes ago. And Glenn is asking if anyone ever showed their teeth in the painting. <laughs> well, you know what? That's actually a very good question. I've done research on that. A lot of people think it's because, oh, they had such bad teeth back then. Uh, but back then, I think everybody had bad teeth. There's a very famous Tiepolo painting done in the 1700s of the dentist coming to town. And basically, dentistry was like, get them drunk and pull it out. Uh, so, but the main reason was that, first of all, it's really hard to hold a smile and they have it look natural for any length of time, but it was also considered undignified. Uh, for instance, uh, Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, who is Marie Antoinette's official court painter, uh, got in trouble once for depicting someone showing their teeth while they were smiling. It was considered rude and undignified because you only smiled and showed your teeth if you were drunk, stupid, or crazy you know, maybe the lower classes, it was considered undignified. So that's why they never showed their teeth, pretty much. Yeah. We um, have another question, too, that just came in that's um, just asking for, like, more clarification about Catherine's relationship to the Pope. Oh, yeah. Her nephew was the Holy Roman Emperor. Remember, uh, Henry VII had actually wanted to marry the Holy, another Holy Roman Emperor's daughter at one point. Uh, so her nephew was the Holy Roman Emperor, and had invaded Rome, and the Pope was under her nephew's power. So that's why the Pope had to kind of play, you know, cat and mouse with Henry and with the Holy Roman Emperor, who is Catherine's nephew. Yeah, got it? Okay. So let us talk about Anne Boleyn. Uh, she was a lady-in-waiting to Catherine of Aragon, and uh, her personal religious affiliation is unknown. Uh, we don't really know if she was a Protestant or a Catholic. Oh, it's really interesting, by the way, Hans Holbein, Henry's court painter, who painted so many people in the, in the British court, was probably thought to be a secret Catholic because he was originally from Germany, and it's thought that he may have been a secret Catholic in Henry VIII's court as well. So uh, Anne Boleyn made the mistake of producing another daughter named Elizabeth. Elizabeth would also eventually become queen, England's second queen, but as I said, there was no precedent for having a queen, and Henry wanted a male heir really, really bad. So he, uh, she had three miscarriages. I mean, imagine how devastating that must have been to her just as a woman to have three miscarriages, even though they were a lot more common back then than they are now. Uh, the idea that she had three miscarriages must have been very devastating, and uh, Henry's affections had already slipped to another lady-in-waiting named Jane Seymour. She was Anne Boleyn's lady-in-waiting. I guess that was like a pretty fertile ground for finding new wives, is just go into the, you know, the field of ladies-in-waiting. So she had three miscarriages. Henry's eyes had already drifted to Jane Seymour. So she was charged with untrumped-up charges of adultery, sedition, trying to overthrow the government, and incest with her brother. That is how bad Henry wanted to get rid of this woman for producing a daughter. So that's part of the reason why maybe the story is so fascinating is just the, the mentality of these people and, you know, just kind of the savage treatment that went on. And it's, you know, makes J.R. Ewing from the Dynasty TV show look like, you know, lamb compared to Henry VIII. So um, she was charged, given all these charges, and she was beheaded in 1536 when her daughter Elizabeth was three years old. Uh, now, Jane Seymour, Henry's third wife, did produce a male heir named Edward, another Edward for you. He became Edward VI eventually, but she died two weeks after giving birth to him, and Henry forever and ever grieved for her. She was officially a Protestant, and... Uh, those are the three most important wives because they're the ones who produced the heirs that we're going to talk about later. We'll run through five, four, five, and six really quickly. This is Anne of Cleves. She was a German princess. Uh, supposedly, you know, Henry only saw her via this portrait. And when he met her in person, he took an immediate dislike to her and accused Holbein of making her look better than she did in real life. We have no idea what she really looked like. So we have to go on surmise. It could just be that Henry didn't like her personality because she was apparently very practical, very, you know, straight laced. And Henry was, you know, much more kind of a wild man. And he just found her totally unappeal unappealing and annulled the marriage after six months. Then his eyes drifted to another lady in waiting. 
Wife number five, Catherine Howard, she was much, much younger. Henry was 49 and she was 16. Uh, and she was executed when Elizabeth uh, Anne Boleyn's, or when uh, Elizabeth Anne Boleyn's daughter was nine years old. Uh, they were so close in age that Elizabeth and uh, Catherine Howard were kind of friends. Uh, and then all of a sudden, another wife of Henry's gets beheaded. Uh, but she had actually committed adultery on Henry with one of his courtiers, a man named Thomas Culpepper. Uh, and uh, she was only actually seven years, she was seven years younger than her stepdaughter, Mary I, who was Catherine of Aragon's daughter. So Henry VIII's fifth wife was seven years younger than his first daughter. And then you have Catherine Parr, his last wife, who basically uh, died in childbirth. Uh, she was the only wife to outlive Henry. She was basically his nursemaid because Henry was in such bad shape by that time. And she died in childbirth a couple of years after Henry died. Uh, and that was her basic role uh, in Henry's life. Uh, so we're going to go on to another painting now. So and this is by an anonymous we, artist. Yeah, got some. Yeah, yeah. So we have a couple of questions. So I'm one, glad. I'm glad people are asking questions. Good. Oh yeah. Yeah. It means they're involved. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, there's one. It kind of goes back a little bit earlier to just the whole split between Catholicism and Anglic Anglican Communion. But like, Glenn is asking if Henry had a bona fide reason for leaving the Catholic Church. Um, just I guess touching on like the no. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted to divorce his wife. That right. was basically yeah. it. You know, I yeah. mean, that that was his main reason. It's like the Pope wouldn't give him what he wanted. And, you know, he actually, yeah, he just broke away from the church because the Pope wouldn't give him what he wanted. And he thought, well, I'm a good Catholic. I should get whatever I want out of the Pope. You know, he's my bud. So, no, he had no legitimate reason whatsoever. Next question. And, yeah. And then the next one is from Nancy about Anne Boleyn. So she was asking if there were also charges of witchcraft, because I think that gets like thrown around like historically about Anne Boleyn. I don't know, if, but I don't know if it's ever been like formally like, and she was a witch or more like rumors around the court, like, well, she had like a sixth finger or like a mole or something. <laughs> like, yeah, no, that's, yeah, that was, that was charges back then. The witchcraft thing I don't know about, but it could very well be. It wouldn't surprise me at all because that was just, you know, easy enough, you know, yeah. a very, very easy crime to be convicted of. You know, and anybody who's a little peculiar back then could be accused of witchcraft. You didn't have to even do anything particularly evil. So, but that, I'm not absolutely sure about that, but could very well be anything else i'm sorry i can't answer better but no that's okay um oh and then monica asked if catherine parr remarried she did yeah uh, catherine parr the last wife yes yeah, she did she died in childbirth okay. so yeah, okay okay i think we're all caught up on questions right now <laughs> okay so now we're showing another painting that's a definite propaganda piece. This is by an anonymous artist, and it's called The Family of Henry VIII, and it's in the mid-1500s, as you see, and it clearly shows the order of succession. Uh, it has, you know, Edward here, his son, and then here is Jane Seymour. By the time this painting was done, Henry would be dead in another two years. He was on his last wife, Catherine Parr, but he's still, as you see, clinging on to Jane Seymour. You know, that's the wife he's portraying himself with, partially to legitimize Edward as the king. And here's Elizabeth and Mary off in the wings, symbolically cut off from the rest of the family, but kind of there. Uh, and uh, yeah, she had, Jane Seymour had already been dead for 10 years. Uh, all of the characters in the painting, except for um, Jane Seymour, are thought to have been painted from life. Uh, in the doorways, you also see two court jesters. This is a woman whose name may have been Jane Beden, uh, but she's generally known as Jane Fool. And to our knowledge, she's the only female jester ever portrayed in a Western art painting. And then this is Henry VIII's court jester, Will Summer who uh, figures into a lot of Henry VIII stories because uh, the gesture is always a foil for the king. Uh, so uh, let's see. Yeah. So this is a definite statement on the continuation of the dynasty because it's showing, you know, the, the uh, alignment of the heirs as Henry wants it stated. If you look up close, you see Mary is shown wearing a cross around her neck 
uh, and uh, Elizabeth is shown with the letter A around her neck, and it's not known what that's symbolic of. Clearly, it shows that she's a Catholic, and this may stand for Anne. It may stand for adultery, and it's not known why they're wearing these necklaces. It could very well be that they're wearing, like, kind of parading their sins around their neck, like she had the sin of being a Catholic, and she has the sin of being Anne Boleyn's daughter. So we don't really know what that's supposed to mean. Uh, so this was not a great year. Uh, let me move on to the painting again. Yeah, uh, England it was being invaded by Catholic countries. Uh, in 1545, French, France sent 30,000 troops and 200 ships. Henry only had 12,000 troops and 80 ships. Uh, he did win the battle eventually, but he lost one of his favorite ships. Uh, none of this is shown, however. Henry is shown in the peak of health. His two daughters are included. Uh, the king is dead center in the painting, right at the vanishing point, which places him in a, you know, puts him in a place of importance. Uh, also, these columns are very classical uh, and, you know, indicate a certain establishment of the house, you know, because columns are associated with, you know, classicism and being very well established. Uh, it could be that the columns were also a reference to this uh, Raphael tapestry that Henry had just acquired by the Italian artist Raphael, and it's called The Healing of the Lame Man, and this may be a reference to Henry VIII's gout. Uh, also, uh, what you have above him is a tapestry called a Balducine, and this is associated with very high order of people, including the Virgin Mary in a lot of Renaissance paintings, and this is a symbol of almost holiness uh, to have this canopy over your head. And then there's a very, very expensive uh, oriental carpet at their feet. Uh, so these are all signs of great wealth uh, and, you know, to show off the power of the kingdom. Uh, yes. Okay, yes. So after Henry VIII dies, Edward does become king. And this is a portrait attributed to a painter called William Scrutz from 1546 or so. And Edward uh, did, uh, let's see, he became king at uh, age of nine. He died at the age of 15, just like his uncle Arthur had. Uh, Edward was very smart, but also known to be very willful, very affable, but also very vol vol volatile. Sorry, I think I need some more water. <laughs> Sorry. He was an affable enough kid, but also very volatile. There's a story that once he went into a rage and just snapped the bird's neck right in his hands, you know, just to do it, just because he was so angry. Uh, he was very close to his stepsisters, but not very close after a while to Mary, the first daughter of Henry VIII, because of her Catholicism. That caused a lot of friction in their relationship, but he was very close to his stepsister, excuse me, Elizabeth. He did continue the conflicts with Scotland and with France and caused a lot of economic issues. He really worked very hard to establish the new Protestant church. He was a devout Protestant, and he worked very, very hard to make sure that the church was established. Uh, but toward the end of his very short reign, England started to develop a certain amount of unrest. So his rule can't really be particularly viewed as that successful. However, there's a lot of statements being made in this painting. Once again, portraits of power, like we're talking about. Uh, according to sumptuary laws, which dictated what classes could wear what, um, he is wearing uh, something that could only be worn by royalty, which is a velvet gown trimmed with lynx fur. And lynx fur, by an order of 1533, is only to be worn above the worn, uh, uh, if you're a duke or higher. Only dukes and higher could wear lynx fur on their robes. So Edward, that's Edward's reign. Then for nine days, uh, Jane Grey ruled. She was Edward's first cousin once removed. She was known as the Queen of Nine Days. It's not even known exactly how many days she ruled for, but not much more or less than nine. She had a reputation for being one of the most learned women of her day. Uh, Edward wanted her to succeed uh, in, de in defiance of Henry's wishes. By this time, uh, Henry had softened toward his two daughters and put them back in the uh, order of secession, but we'll get into that when we talk about Elizabeth I a little later. So against his father's wishes, Edward VI wanted his cousin, Lady Jane Grey, to become queen, 
but she didn't really have the support of the people or of uh, the royalty. She was never crowned. The privileged chamber uh, who decided such things changed sides and decided to make Mary uh, Henry's first daughter, the Queen of England, instead. Uh, Mary's life was initially spared, but uh, she was eventually seen to be a threat to the crown, and Mary had her executed, and this painting was done four year, four year, 40 years after her death. Uh, she, this painting may have been done as one of a series of paintings of Protestant martyrs, uh, and we're going to get into that a little later as well. Uh, and there are scratch marks on the painting, which means it may have been attacked by iconoclasts you know, Catholic iconoclasts who wanted to destroy the painting. And then along comes Mary. And this is Henry VIII's first daughter. And she takes the throne after uh, Lady Jane Grey's unfortunate and short rule. Uh, so uh, she is Catholic and half Spanish, as you recall. So she has a very strong attachment to Spain. She was very unpopular as a ruler. If you look at her portrait, she almost always looks really kind of testy. She always looks like kind of annoyed. And that's generally considered to be her personality. Uh, these paintings were done uh, by uh, an Italian artist and an English artist. Uh, and it does show a certain, we'll get into the difference between the English and Italian schools of art a little later. Uh, but she did marry actually a Spanish king, Philip II, who was the son of her first cousin, Charles V, who was the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, so she married a Catholic and a Spanish Habsburg. He was associated with the Habsburg family in the Spanish branch. So she got her desire to marry a Spanish prince because she was very strongly associated with Spain and affiliated with Spain and loved Spain, Spanish things. And she got to marry the Spanish prince. For her, it was more a marriage of love. For him, it was more a political marriage uh, and also a religious marriage for her. And you have to remember that her mother was a Spanish princess. And she also wanted to produce a Catholic heir in order to prevent her stepsister, Elizabeth, from becoming queen. Uh, and she was England's very first queen ever. So you have to realize what a precedent that was back in those days. Uh, and she had no idea how to be a queen. She assumed she would need a king because nobody had ever been queen before. So she and Philip kind of ruled as co-king, co co-queen kind of arrangement. And... Uh, they were co-rulers of England. She assumed that England would want to go back to Catholicism, which they did not. My paper stuck together. Okay. Uh, she launched on a persecution campaign against Protestants, uh, and she got the name nickname Bloody Mary as a result. And since then, history has been a little more kind to her and say, well, she probably didn't execute as many people as her father did because Henry VIII also executed an awful lot of people. Uh, so this is a piece of what's called atrocity propaganda from Mary's reign, and it's thought to be pretty reliable. This is from a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs, also known as Acts and Monuments. It's from 1563 by a man named John Fox. So the book was written by a Protestant, and is a history of Protestant of Christian martyrs throughout Western history, emphasizing English Protestants and proto-Protestants from the 14th century all the way up to the time of Mary I. So this is showing uh, the first uh, victim of the Marian persecution against Protestants. Uh, and uh, this is a man named John Rogers, who was executed in 1555 as part of these Marian prosecutions. Uh, this book was widely read by uh, Protestants, especially English Puritans. In case you don't know the, who the Puritans are, the people who came to America, you know, on the Mayflower, the, the Puritans were actually extremist Protestants who thought that Henry VIII's church was not far away enough from the Catholic Church. And being raised Roman Catholic, I will vouch for the fact that the Episcopalian Church, which is the American version of the Anglican Church, is referred to as Catholic light. Uh, because it's very, very close to Roman Catholicism, and the Puritans thought that Henry VIII did not break away far enough from the Catholic Church, and that's why they came to, Eng to America from England. Uh, so this book, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, was influential for centuries. Unfortunately uh, for the Catholics in England, Mary died childless after five years, and Philip lost his kingship, and consequently, 
Elizabeth the first becomes queen. Oh, before and this, we get into Elizabeth, sorry, because yeah. Elizabeth, I imagine, is going to be like the heavy hitter. Um, oh, she's a, question, a heavy hitter for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Um, we have a question about like what actually was Jane Grey's claim to the throne, other than being Edward's cousin. He wanted her to be. That's, yeah. She didn't really have a particular claim to the throne. Yeah. I mean, Henry had established, and that's we're going to talk about that a little bit with this particular painting, because this painting is very symbolic uh, as far as what Elizabeth is wearing. Uh, but as far as I know, Jane Grey didn't really have a particular claim to the throne because the king had kind of stated, you know, that. But like I said, also, England was a constitutional monarchy. Back in the Middle Ages, they had a body that decided who was going to be king called the Witan or W-Y-T-A-N, the Witan. And like, so there was a council that had to vote to elect the king, basically. So the kingship wasn't the same as it was in, say, France under Louis XIV or something like that. So if Henry said he wanted uh, his daughters to follow Edward, say anything happened to Edward, which he, I'm sure he didn't count on. I'm sure he thought Edward's going to live a long time. Uh, but he wanted his daughters to be next in line for the throne. And Edward went against those wishes because, you know, he wanted to have a Protestant queen, you know, so not really any claim particularly, no. Any other questions? No. As of now, no. Okay. Well, then let's take a deep breath <laughs> and I'll have a sip of water. Maybe I'll have a sip. I have a cup of coffee here. It's got enough sugar to put me into a coma and that's what's going to keep me going. Part of what makes my lectures interesting sometimes is you never know what's going to happen when my blood sugar level drops, what I'm going to spill, what I'm going to forget I'm talking about. The last time I gave this lecture, I almost choked to death in front of a live audience on a piece of dried mango. So that's why I have this cup of very heavily sugared coffee to keep me going in case I get hungry, although I am pretty well fed. And I have my water here, and then we'll go into Elizabeth. Because as we said, she is the heavy hitter. So Elizabeth I lived from 1533 to 1603, and her reign lasted from 1558 to 1603. She became queen at the age of 24. She was England's second queen, clearly, and she ruled for 44 years. Uh, she, ascended the, she ascended the throne despite really, when you think about it, nearly impossible odds. You know, uh, first of all, the general Tudor legitimacy. You know, the Tudor was not, the Tudors were not the most legitimate claimants to the throne to begin with. Second of all, Catherine of Aragon was still alive when she was born. Uh, she witnessed the murder of her mother when she was age three, the murder of her friend, Catherine Howard, at age nine. Uh, you know, so, Kath, uh, yeah, Catherine had just been killed five months earlier before she took the throne. Uh, she saw the, uh, yeah, at the age of nine, she saw the execution of Catherine Howard, who was her friend. I'm sorry, I just lost track for a second. There's one of those adventures I was talking about just now. Uh, she had to uh, regain her legitimacy as an heir because for a long time, Mary and Elizabeth both were considered illegitimate by Henry. He did not acknowledge their claim to the throne as all, at all. Uh, and that's part of the reason why this painting is very interesting because it's unknown who commissioned this painting. Uh, Elizabeth is wearing clothing that is only intended for royalty. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit as we go on about the painting. Uh, but uh, she was the second woman ruler also after a disastrous first woman ruler, her half-sister Mary, her stepsister Mary. Uh, and uh, she had to see Mary, her brother, her stepbrother, and her stepsister die before she could ascend the throne. So really, when you talk about near impossible odds, I think that's a pretty good indication of the odds she was up against. She was the only woman ruler in all of Europe, and she used her marriage ability as a bargaining chip. Uh, she did not assume, like her sister Mary, that she would have to have a, a king. She knew that she was going to rule by herself. Maybe she was soured on men because of her experiences with her father, but even more than her father. And Henry VIII had 98 portraits of himself done. You have to th he ruled for you know, what, uh, 35 years, 36 years, and he had 98. That's like three portraits a year almost that he had of himself. And Elizabeth outdid him. And she really used these portraits to craft her image and to show England's power. 
Uh, she had a relationship with Philip II, her ex-brother-in-law, but it was quite different from uh, Mary's relationship with him, and we'll get into that a little different a little later too. Uh, Philip II actually did propose to her to marriage, and she kept deferring until eventually the relationship went south, uh, and there was a lot of belligerence back and forth. Uh, in 1584, Philip II signed a treaty with some other Catholic countries against England, uh, and Elizabeth got even by uh, siding with allies, uh, Protestant allies who were in the Netherlands who were fighting against Spain because the Netherlands were under control of Spain at the time, and Elizabeth sided with the Protestants. So this kind of back and forth bantering went back and forth on a kind of national level. Uh, English ships started to pirate Spanish ships, Spanish trade ships, and that cut into Philip II's income an awful lot. Uh, in 1586, Philip sent his armada, his navy, to invade England, and they were defeated by the British under Francis Drake, and we're going to talk about that a few slides from now. I think everybody knows the story of the Spanish armada, and we'll talk about that when we showed the armada portrait that Elizabeth had done to get even with her brother-in-law. Uh, so Elizabeth did bring a lot of social and economic stability to England and once again helped establish its power even more than her father did. She really consolidated to her power, even as she left no heir. Uh, she brought a lot of economic stability. This painting is attributed, once again, like the portrait of her uh, stepbrother Edward, to William Scrotts, and it was done when she was age 14, although she looks like she's about 26 here, but who knows. Uh, in any case... It was probably made for Henry VIII, but it first appeared in the collection of her. I, I've been saying stepbrother. I should be saying half-brother, shouldn't I? I have to get that straight in my head. Half-brother. Yeah, I think Ed, these are half-brothers. If you have a common father, but not. Yeah, I think. Isn't step when you're related by marriage? Whatever it is. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Whichever it is. But you get the idea. You know who they are. Uh, so this painting was all, this painter also painted Edward VI, her half brother, uh, and she is very symbolically holding two books to show how learned she is. And it's assumed that these two books are the Old and the New Testaments. The painting has a general feeling of studiousness and piety and seriousness and devotion. It's very contemplative. In all of Elizabeth's portraits, her hands are always very prominent. She was very proud of her hands. She thought she had very nice hands and showed them off all the time. And now we're going to get into the clothing part and why this painting is so symbolically interesting. The gown is very, very expensive. Uh, although Elizabeth was known to be, unlike her father, a very thrifty shopper, uh, this is a crimson fabric uh, dyed with expensive dye, a red dye called cochineal, uh, the Spanish had a monopoly on this red dye. Uh, it came from little bugs that lived on certain cactuses in Mexico. And this dye was consequently immensely expensive. And it was woven with solid gold, that cloth of gold thread I was talking about. You know, this is solid gold thread. And I mean, you can look up in a little detail and see just how intricate this is and how long this must have taken to make and how much it must have cost. Uh, and it's got a pomegranate pattern, which was associated with the ecclesi ecclesiastical class, with the priestly class. And it was also considered very exotic and expensive because it generally came from the Far East. This pomegranate uh, pattern kind of originated in Persia and was considered very exotic and luxurious. All these fabrics were made by hand. And fabrics back then were one of the most expensive things anybody could own. Fabrics of this quality were immensely expensive. Uh, so, uh, the fact that she's wearing, oh, also, I have to get into the undergarment, the front of the skirt and the undersleeves here, this is another very expensive fabric known as cloth of silver, it's a very thin gauze-like material that's tissued with gold thread, so the outfit is basically solid gold and very expensive fabrics, dyed with very expensive dyes, uh, so uh, this is a statement in the fact that she's wearing this very expensive outfit that is exclusively meant for royalty. Now, what this means symbolically depends on who commissioned the painting, and we have no idea who commissioned the painting. This was shortly after Elizabeth regained her legitimacy to the throne. So if it was commissioned by Elizabeth herself, 
it was a very bold statement of look at me, I'm royalty. If it was commissioned by her father, Henry VIII, it can be seen as a sign of his forgiveness and his acceptance of her back into the lineage for the throne. And if it was commissioned by Henry VIII's wife, Catherine Parr, she's probably the one who is instrumental in reuniting Henry with his daughters and, you know, putting them back in line for the throne. Then it's seen as maybe some kind of gesture to convince Henry that Elizabeth is indeed a legitimate heir to the throne. So we have no idea what it symbolizes, but no matter what it does, it's very interesting in that way. So yeah, the, the tissued fabrics could only be worn by royalty. Uh, yeah, so this is only three years after she got her reclaim uh, status to the throne. Uh, Elizabeth did not have an exclusive portraitist, unlike a lot of uh, royalty did. And a lot of these were gifts for uh, foreign monarchs uh, and marriage portraits, although she never did marry. marry. Uh, this is her coronation portrait, uh, and this is, you know, unusually face on, once again, looking right at us. Uh, this is kind of a dig at her sister Mary, because she is wearing Mary's gown, which has been altered to suit her body. Uh, she's also wearing ermine, which is reserved for royalty. And here you see the English Tudor rose, and there's fleur-de-lis here, you know, showing her uh, claim to the French throne as well. And this is very, very straight on. This is a copy of a lost original. But as you go on, you see the paintings get more and more weird and theatrical and kind of allegorical. Uh, this is this full face pose is also very often used for uh, coins and seals. You know, face on and profile is very often used for coins and you know things that are widely distributed throughout the kingdom. Uh, so we talked about the gown already. Uh, the, yeah. Also, the fleur de lis was seen as a sign of the Virgin Mary. Elizabeth very strongly associated herself with the Virgin Mary because she was a Virgin Queen and used that virginity as a bargaining tool, as I said before. Also, roses, the Tudor rose, not necessarily the Tudor rose, but roses were also associated with the Virgin Mary. Uh, she has a very high hairline, which was a sign of a high intellect. Back then, women actually plucked their foreheads to make their high, hairline higher to make them look more highbrow, consequently more intelligent. Uh, let's see. So this is another painting, another yeah, allegorical sorry. painting. Yeah. Oh, um, I guess like going off of that painting. So Barbara asked, um, so I understand that these portraits are to show the status of the subject. Um, but when will artists start to focus on realistic hands? <laughs> um, so that's yeah. Well, the, no, the thing is, these are very stylized on purpose. And that's one thing that that show at the Met, the one thing that was great about the show at the Met was it was, I mean, I'm talking about the portraits. They had lots of these portraits. A lot of them I got to see live, but they also had uh, a lot of things, a lot of uh, you know, objects and miniatures and furniture and even Henry VIII's suit of armor. Uh, so there were a lot of things, and they were very, very well exposed to all the trends that were happening in the rest of Europe. Like they were very familiar with Renaissance art, uh, and they purposely chose the style. If you look up at the details of these paintings, you see that the work on these paintings is exquisite. And these painters had every ability to paint as realistically as they wanted, and this was a conscious choice. Part of it, uh, and we'll get into the symbolism uh, I, I was lucky enough to hear a lecture by one of the curators at the Met Show, a woman named Elizabeth Cleland, and she was their curator of European direct decorative arts, I think. And she pointed out that this was a very conscious effort to uh, more medieval art that would associate the Tudors with the King Arthur and the Round Table. And there are a number of other stylistic choices. Uh, but this was a very conscious choice to make them look this way. And I'll, I'll get more into that as we get more into the portraits of why they look this way. So, yeah, no, but it wasn't because they couldn't. It's because this was a chosen style. So this painting here, any, is there any other questions? Or? Right now, no, there's, I have one more, but he asked to just ask it at the end because it's kind of complicated and over. Viewing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this painting is called the, the Family of Henry VIII, an Allegory of the Tudor Succession. And it was from 1590. And this is the second version of this painting. There is another one by an anonymous artist. And the purpose and the patron of this painting is unknown. 
but it is to celebrate the harmony that was established by Queen Elizabeth. Uh, it was probably used to establish the righteousness of the Tudor line. You see here's Edward, you know, long dead Edward and long dead Mary. Uh, and here's Elizabeth. And you see the color difference here. Mary is depicted in black and Philip is depicted in black. And, you know, Elizabeth and these allegorical figures are in white, which makes them stand out more and, you know, kind of cast Mary in a dark light symbolically. You also notice there's a, this very cloudy sky behind Mary and, you know, uh, Elizabeth enters stage left uh, with followed by peace and prosperity. You see, this is the allegorical figure of peace stepping on a shield. And this is prosperity holding a cornucopia to represent all the good things that Elizabeth has brought to the kingdom in contrast to all the bad things that Elizabeth or that Mary and Philip brought to England, namely war and disruption. And they are being followed by the god of war, Mars, who's also dressed in black. So this is very symbolic. Uh, you know, to establish Elizabeth's reign and to show her closeness to Edward as well. Uh, let's see. Also, Henry is about to hand a scepter to Edward and a sword. Uh, yeah. So all paintings from White, the Whitehall mural that we talked about in the palace that burned down were used as models for all the figures in these paintings. Next slide. Now, this is called the Darnley portrait, and um, this was thought to be the only portrait Elizabeth, of Elizabeth done from life. Uh, if you look at the details, you can see this is really quality painting here. You know, this, I mean, look at just these little lines. If you, These paintings are not that big. These are just tiny, tiny little lines, and this is the brooch that Elizabeth is wearing up close. The detail is exquisite. They could paint as realistically as they wanted. They just chose not to. And I guess she, remember, she was very proud of her hands. I guess she just wanted them to look like that, kind of in this pose. It's, now that I look at it, it's almost sort of like what ballerinas do with their fingers. They put their thumb and their middle finger together, and that's not how they do it. I can't do it, but you know, that's kind of a ballet pose almost. They're very stylized. I think she wanted them probably to look like alabaster, like they're carved out of ivory or something. Uh, but it's called the Darnley Portrait, and it was probably painted from life. Consequently, all future uh, portraits are done from templates of this painting. And a lot of portraits back then were done from templates. They would take one painting and it'd be used over and over and over again. A lot of nobles actually copy these paintings as well to have in their own palaces to show their loyalty to the Tudor line. So, you know, these pattern painters would work on these patterns based on the uh, Darnley portrait, which was painted from life, and her paintings consequently do not age very much at all. Uh, you see she's wearing this kind of very military kind of doublet looking thing. It makes her look much more military and sort of masculine. That is a very conscious choice. One of the Elizabeth movies that I didn't see, I think Kate Winslet was in it maybe, and I saw the coming attractions at another movie. And it's like there's a scene where they show her before she becomes queen. She's this, you know, long haired kind of happy young woman. And then she comes out after she's queen and the wigs are on, the makeup's on, the armor's on. She's like, you know, all business. So it's a very conscious image choice. The brooch she's wearing that I'm uh, showing the detail of is surrounded by classical gods to show that she had a very classical education and was exposed to all, you know, had a full liberal arts education, was a very, you know, intelligent woman. Uh, let's see. Yes. So this is a big red ruby. It's kind of, a, you know, typical of Renaissance jewelry of the time, but it's surrounded by the goddess of wisdom, Minerva, at the top, Jupiter, the king of all the gods at the base, Am I the, yeah, Venus, the goddess of love, and Mars, the god of war, with Cupid in the center. So it has all these gods representing all these different, you know, aspects of, you know, love, war, power, and uh, what was the other one? Yeah, the ruler of all the gods, and wisdom, wisdom, that was the other one. So a lot of times these jewels were given from one courtier to another, and maybe this was a gift from someone who was courting Elizabeth, but they reflect the queen's classical learning. Now, this is also where we get into the difference between the Italian and the uh, English style. The Italian style that we saw, like in those paintings of Mary and Philip by Antonio Moro, uh, were very, very realistic, you know, very modeled, a lot of shading. 
Uh, they very ch consciously chose this style. It's thought because this painting originally had a little more red on the cheeks and the red kind of faded out a bit. But Elizabeth wanted herself portrayed without any shadows on her face, very much on purpose. It's thought that it emphasized her English white skin, you know, and showed her very Englishness. It's also thought that because if there's no shadows, you can't see any wrinkles and she never aged very much in her paintings. Another thing is that she very often affiliated herself with the sun. And she was known to say, as the sun is a source of all light, the sun has no shadows on it. Why should I? So these could be any number of reasons for that. It's also a little closer to the Northern Renaissance style in general. In places like, you know, Germany and, and Holland, they painted in a much more hard edge kind of stylized style. And they didn't study anatomy and perspective the same way that they did in Italy and Spain. Uh, so it was kind of a different style in the North of Renaissance, Northern Renaissance anyway. And I think they affiliated themselves much more with that. And there's also that thing that Dr. Cleland said in the lecture about maybe wanting to associate themselves with King Arthur and going for more kind of, you know, less naturalistic style, more medieval sort of style. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that covers all that. She would very often later on in life wear piles of white makeup to give herself that youthful appearance. And unfortunately, it contained lead, so it wound up kind of eating away at her, at her skin as she was trying to make herself more look more youthful. Uh, let's see. So, what am I doing here? Oh, yes, yeah, so I see. We have another portrait we're moving on to. This is called the Pelican Portrait, and it's also very symbolic. You see just the richness of this clothing. I mean, it's astounding, you know, how, how much detail there is. Remember, this is all handmade. Everything she's wearing is hand stitched. You see here in this portrait, she's wearing, she has the Tudor rose and the French fleur de lis, and she is wearing a pelican uh, pendant around her breasts. You can't really see it, but it is a pelican. And that is very symbolic. It represents the queen charity and her redemption uh, and her selfless love for her subjects. And that is how Elizabeth liked to have herself portrayed. You see, once again, no crown, you know, just some kind of jewels in her hair, on her wig. Uh, but pelicans, the reason she chose a pelican as a symbol is that there was a legend that pelicans pricked themselves and fed their young uh, with their own blood and died in the process. So pelicans kind of became associated with Jesus Christ. And Elizabeth is using this as a symbol for her sacrifice to her people. And, you know, as I said, the pelicans came to re represent uh, Jesus. This is an almost twin portrait by the same artist, Nicholas Hilliard. Once again, that same template, three-quarter face, white, no shadows, you know. And in this case, uh, the phoenix, you know, rose in the ashes and represents sacrifice and rebirth. Now we're going to get into the real heavy one where she gets really even with Philip II. This is the Armada portrait. And you can see just how bizarre <laughs> these paintings are getting. I mean, these are just way over the top theatrical. Uh, so the Armada portrait was done in 1588 by an unknown artist who was previously attributed to an artist named George Gower. And there are three versions of it. Uh, and it's almost kind of like a sequential thing. Like, here's the arrival of the Spanish Armada. Here's Elizabeth. Here's the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Like, almost like step one, step two, step three. You know, here you are. Here I am. There you go. Uh, and although these, these events happened weeks apart, it's shown happening almost on two simultaneous movie screens at the same time, making it look like here they come, there they go. Uh, and uh, this is when uh, her ex brother-in-law, Philip next Portugal, which was also a naval power and claimed ownership of all the seas of the entire world. And she said, well, that's kind of a big claim to make and we have a Navy too. So uh, the defeat of the Spanish Armada was considered, you know, an economic war plus a religious war between a Protestant power and a Catholic par power. Elizabeth very purposely kept this from being a religious conflict in her view. Uh, the Spanish had priests and monks on their ships, and the English made sure they did not. Uh, so uh, the English ships were a lot lighter and faster. They did not go on the Spanish ships and engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, 
uh, but currents and navigational errors and a lack of supplies were also con contributed to the Spanish defeat. Uh, the English also set their own ships on fire in order to freak the Spanish out. And basically only a third of the Spanish sailors made it back. And the English, of course, and this is a line, I do a whole lecture on propaganda and art. And this is a line you hear constantly with any kind of painting that's used for propaganda. It was divine providence. God willed it. And that is why, you know, that's the whole point of this. So uh, this painting is life-size. Let's see. This is a close-up of the coming and going of the Armada. So this painting is life-size. Uh, Elizabeth, by this time, is 56 years old, uh, which back then was fairly old. You know, fake hair, total wig, thick white makeup to give the illusion of youth. Once again, no aging whatsoever. By this time, though, however, uh, according to stories, her teeth were absolutely black based on her love of sugared desserts. Uh, but next to her arm, you see her crown is off to the side, once again, showing a certain deference to her, pe her people. She's not holding a scepter, but she does have her hand on a globe, which represents the English claim in the Americas. In 1587, the first uh, English citizen had been born in America in Virginia, the name for the Virgin Queen, and the child's name was Virginia Dare. So the Queen is very involved in all this. She also how this is on this big ruff that makes it look like she's being surrounded by the sun. Once again, there's that uh, sun symbolism. Also wearing a string of pearls that were given to her probably by Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, who is her longtime suitor and had just died that year. It's made up of 600 pearls. Pearls were associated with virginity and with the sea as well. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to talk about the mermaid on this chair, that's another dig at her ex-brother-in-law. Mermaids lured sail were women who lured sailors to their deaths. <laughs> so she's getting a, a dig in at her ex-brother-in-law with the mermaid in the chair there. Next. Okay, so this is the Ditchley portrait. This was in the Met show. And this painting uh, was done in 1592 or so. Con commissioned by Sir Henry Lee, who is Elizabeth Master of the Armory and the first person to hold the office of Queen's Champion. And this would become a, an honorary or hereditary office of the royal household, uh, which was to challenge anyone who contested the Queen's claim to the throne uh, by engaging them in a personal duel. Uh, he resigned that position in 1590. But this painting was commissioned by Henry Lee in order to commemorate the queen's forgiveness of him because he took a mistress that she did not approve of. The mistress that Sir Henry Lee took was of ill repute and Elizabeth did not uh, approve of his dalliance. And consequently, he was made a stranger to the court and was out of favor to, for two years. When he was finally allowed back in the queen's good graces, he was so grateful he had this portrait commissioned. Now, uh, the reason this is called the Ditchley portrait is because that is where Sir Henry Lee lived, and she is actually standing on a map of England right on his estate. <laughs> like she is, you know, so that is the symbolism of this portrait. She's all dressed in white, you know, showing her status as the Virgin Queen. You see, you know, sunny times ahead, stormy times behind. So that supposedly, you know, symbolizes the Queen's forgiveness. Back on this little plaque here, there's a sonnet probably written by Sir Henry Lee himself, comparing the queen to the sun. So he's really, really tripping all over himself to get back in her great good graces. Now, um, one thing I wanna talk about um, this painting, this guy here, uh, this is, uh, oh, also I forgot to mention, there are some uh, inscriptions floating around in the painting which we don't exactly know what the meaning is, but they were added to the painting probably by Sir Henry. She gives and does not expect. She can, but does not take revenge. In giving back, she increases. So these are all really major compliments to the queen. Uh, so Sir Henry was also the originator of what's called the Ascension Day Tilt. And this was a big parade that uh, honored the queen's ascension to the throne. And who we have over here is uh, William Devereux, who is the second Earl of Essex and one of the Queen's favorites. Uh, he is dressed all in black because during this big pageant that was given in honor of the Queen's ascension, 
he dressed all in black and was brought in literally on a funeral bier uh, as part of this procession in order as to make a kind of joke to the queen about how um, he had um, an unsuccessful campaign in Ireland. And so he was begging the queen's forgiveness by wearing this funerary outfit and being paraded in front of the queen in a funerary procession. She did not find it amusing. And eventually Essex um, broke away from the queen and started a rebellion against her and was eventually executed for it. Now we're gonna look at another portrait, one of the last called uh, the Rainbow Portrait from 1600 or so. One of the last portraits of Queen Elizabeth, also one of the most symbolic. Uh, her gown is emblazoned with wildflowers. See all the wildflowers here? Uh, and these are uh, symbolic of Astria, who is the virgin goddess. Once again, virgin, virginity, big, big, big deal here. She was a goddess of justice, innocence, purity, and precision. She, this goddess referred to in the Roman poet Virgil, was referred to by the Roman poet Virgil, and in Shakespeare uh, and other English poets like Milton and uh, Edmund Spencer. Uh, and the return of Astria to Earth uh, represented the return of a golden age. So that is what those wildflowers on Elizabeth's bodice represent. Uh, also, uh, Astria was associated with Virgo, uh, which Elizabeth, by the way, was. She was actually born under the sign of the Virgin. Uh, her cloak, oddly enough, is covered with eyes and ears, showing how she's always watching and listening to what's going on in the court. She has on a crescent-shaped jewel that represents the moon goddess Cynthia, who is the original moon goddess, uh, the original Artemis, the original goddess of, yeah, I'm sorry, the original moon goddess uh, was named Cynthia, and she's wearing a moon-shaped jewel, and Cynthia was eventually become Artemis the goddess of the moon. She's also got a snake embroidered on her sleeve, which represents her cunning. She's wearing a red heart-shaped jewel around her neck, which uh, represents her giving counsel that generally comes from her heart. The rainbow in the portrait uh, that you can see up to the side here uh, represents peace and puts her in the, the heavens and actually is symbolic of God's covenant with Noah after the ark. So there's a lot of symbolism. There's also a Latin inscription here, non sine sole iris, which means no rainbow without the sun, the sun meaning, of course, Elizabeth. And the costume itself, I think, is very theatrical. It looks like something Titania would have worn in Midsummer Night's Dream. And actually, Midsummer Night's Dream had just been written a couple of years before that. So it may be very theatrical, referring to Shakespeare on purpose. And once again, Elizabeth looks like she's about 30. And she's actually close to dying here. Uh, so post Elizabeth, there is no heir. And her third cousin, James, the King of Scotland, becomes the king. Uh, he was baptized Catholic, raised Presbyterian, supported the Anglican Church. He persecuted Catholics, but also wanted her son, his son to marry a Spaniard. So he was kind of on the fence religiously. Uh, and uh, he, yeah, so... He introduced what was called the Jacobean Age because Elizabeth produced no heir. And this was a whole another era in English history. And that's where we end the, the lecture at exactly, I think, 759. Do we have any further questions? Um, I, I'll get back to that question that I mentioned that earlier. Um, yeah. So it's still kind of, it goes way back. It's about like the breaking of Rome or breaking of the Church of England from Rome. Um, and it's just asking, so, okay, when, when Spain sacked Rome, Henry left the Catholic Church, but I think, like, that it's, it's a bit confusing, because, like, that, it wasn't, that's not what led, like, that happened in the background, and it wasn't so much a sack, it was like, Henry wanted to get the annulment, because he married his brother's widow, or brother's widow. Um, yes. Right, and then like the Pope was. Well, that was his claim. His claim was that oh, right. there's something in Leviticus. Apparently, I don't know who Leviticus was, but Leviticus is always is all yeah. about like what you can't do in the sack. Yeah, and there's a passage in Leviticus about you should not see your brother's nakedness or something. Yeah. So the Henry insisted that the reason he didn't produce a male heir yeah. was because he had an incestuous marriage that was cursed by God. 
Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. And then like the the whole her nephew who was the Holy Roman Emperor like like threatened the Pope to like not grant the annulment. Like it wasn't necessarily like Henry was like see like what's happening here. I can. It's more that like everyone's pressuring the Pope both ways, and he's in, like stuck between like you know. He's, like, he's, yes. Exactly. <laughs> like he cannot. He cannot say like no one's a hero in this story. It's right. Exactly. Like, <laughs> so that's where the Pope is in a bad situation and he, he yeah. tried to delay it as long as possible. And then Henry finally got sick of it and said, okay, hell with you, I'll make my own church. Right. So does that answer the question? Um, I think so. Does it, does to whoever asked this question, does that, is that sufficient? Yeah. I'm going to take that as a yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. So we don't have any more questions that I can see. Oh, um, oh, someone just said, Nancy said it's a wonderful presentation. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. I like so, you, Nancy. <laughs> yeah, I know. She's asking great questions. Um, I mean, I don't know how long you have to stick around. If you want to stick around for like another minute or two to see. I can do that. Yeah. I mean, cool. I'm pretty generous with my time and I'm not going anywhere tonight. This is, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Nancy said she likes you too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, um, I'm going to link actually, because I was doing some rapid Googling as this is going on too. So um, the, the Matt, was the Matt right um, that where you saw this? Yeah, the present like that's moving over to Cleveland. So if you, which is not too far from us. So if you still want to see this like Tudor exhibit that you were referencing in 2020. Oh, yeah, I was know it was moving to Cleveland after that. Yeah, no, it's a really good show. Yeah. Uh, I, and there's, I mean, to see these things in person, there really you should go up close and just look at the details of these paintings even though they're very stylized it's not because they couldn't the the painting is unbelievable the, yeah. the amount of detail i mean if you think about like netherlandish painters in the northern renaissance like jan von eyck they were like really into getting every little detail of every little thing and they kind of went for that Michelangelo, this is just a side note, Michelangelo did not like most northern renaissance art he said that it was too involved with details and not enough grandeur yeah. So the Italians in Northern Renaissance didn't necessarily see eye to eye. Yeah. Yeah. Although both made their contributions to right. Renaissance art. Yeah. Okay. I'm still not seeing any questions. I am seeing some more thank yous and oh. that it was very enjoyable. Okay. Well, I'm um, glad. Well, yeah. It's really complicated. I'm, I'm glad people have sat there. <laughs> this is like one of the most complicated lectures. I even get nervous giving it because it's so many Edwards, so many Kings. So, you know, it's like, yeah. even though it's such a short period of time, there's so much happening. Um, okay. Glenn is asking who was Essex? Like, I guess the, um, the, the Lord you mentioned. Yeah. Lord end. Essex. Yeah. yeah. He was one of Elizabeth's favorites. He was, oh, I have more to talk about. Yeah, He was one of Elizabeth's favorites. It's rumored they were lovers, but you know, Nobody really knows about Queen Elizabeth's sex life, whether she actually was a virgin or not. You know, there's no way to find out now, certainly. But she really, you know, held on to that image and pushed that very strongly. I mean, the whole Virgo thing, associations with every virgin goddess there ever was, you know, uh, anything like that. Wearing white all the time, you know, it's all the pearls, the roses, everything. Virgin Mary, you know, she really played it up. Right. Yeah. So Essex was was a, was a courtier. Uh, he actually uh, Elizabeth. This was a very cougar kind of affair because he was much younger. If they had an affair, uh, he was much much younger than Elizabeth, and she had also his father was also another of her favorites. Uh, had you know the one who gave her the necklace for the, the yeah the Armada portrait Robert Dudley that was another. This was his his stepson. Yeah. So she had the father and the stepson as favorites, whatever favorites meant. Yeah. Can you, so there's another question by Glenn about Errol Flynn. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. Yeah. No, there was a Betty Davis, Errol Flynn movie called Elizabeth and Essex. Ah, okay. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That makes it sense. does look like Errol Flynn, doesn't he? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure she looks so much like Betty Davis, but. <laughs> um i think that's everything again i just want to thank the friends of the troy public library whose 
lovely work is what makes these events possible um, so that everyone can attend them for free and learn so, so much about the tutors and their crazy cousins and how they all were vying for power. So. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. And for, oh, yeah. and we had really for going good. through the whole thing, like, you know, yeah. like I said, very complicated. I remember just, there'll be a test in the morning, by the way. And everybody's yeah, yeah. 15 yeah. page paper. Yeah. yeah. And then if anyone's still here, again, I shot it over at the beginning, but here is a link to our survey from the adult services department, um, where you can give us, it's like the Troy MI RJA. Um, you can click that link and fill out our survey. We'll look at those results and see um, how you guys like the program, but we also use it to plan programs in the future um, just to get the community's interest. So, yeah, so I will see Jean in um, about like two more weeks. <laughs> Hopefully I see all of you guys too. And then with that, I'm just going to say good night. Okay. Yeah. Tell everybody. All right. Thank you so much. And yeah, so call it a night now. <laughs>